What's up guys? Welcome to the Fantasy Addiction Network. Today we're talking the XFL. We're looking at the New York Guardians. We're going to be doing an XFL fantasy football player rankings and offensive breakdown of the New York Guardians. Not going to waste any time. Let's get right into it. All right, guys, so let's begin by looking at the head coach of the New York Guardians. So it's Kevin Gilbride, formerly the offensive coordinator for the New York Giants all the way back in uh, 2013. So he's kind of been out of the game for a while, but this is a completely new game. They got him to come out of retirement, excited him enough to come back to New York and coach another football team here. So it's going to be really interesting to see the type of offensive philosophy that um, he brings into this team. I Looking just based on the way that they've constructed their roster, it seems that they're going to be a little bit more focused on trying to do like power running. But overall, I think that that's probably not going to work too well in this league. I think that overall, the strength of this roster is pretty high. They just need to make sure that they use their assets in an appropriate manner if they want to make sure that they succeed in this league. But let's break down each guy one by one, uh, looking from a fantasy lens here. So we will begin with the quarterbacks, uh, beginning with Matt McGloin. Uh, so he has a pretty decent supporting cast of receivers, and I think Matt McGloin has every chance of being successful in this league. He's not really prolific or extremely talented in any one area, but I think if he can avoid turnovers, he can definitely be the XFL's version, version of like a game manager, similar to that of like Alex Smith. And that could definitely still warrant fantasy value just because in a league like this, if you have a quarterback that's at least, as at least competent and can keep playing well and avoid too many turnovers, that's going to be a relevant and useful fantasy asset. Um, I think the, his lack of overall talent keeps him from having the ceiling of someone like Cardale Jones or Josh Johnson, but I think with that comes a cheaper draft day price. So if your option is to try to wait on quarterback, I think Matt McGloin ends up being a nice mid-tier option for you guys. Now, um, he does have a backup, Marquise Williams. His measurables aren't really that different from McGloin. So if McGloin does start throwing picks or just overall underwhelms and he ends up getting benched, or if he gets hurt, I do think that Marquise Williams can probably just pick up right where McGloin left off. And from a fantasy perspective, you can probably expect about the same output from both him and the players around him should that happen. Um, but let's jump over to the running backs and start breaking this down. Now, I mentioned at the start that I think that this offensive philosophy, they're looking to center this more around power running backs. And I, I say that because when you look at their first running back that they drafted, Tim Cook, he dra they drafted him in the fourth round. He's a big bodied runner with uh, low overall speed, but is you know pretty athletic and strong. Otherwise, um, really compares to like fullbacks. I think his best comparable player is like Kyle Juszczyk for the 49ers. So the first running back that they selected was more of a fullback, which again is what's angling me to believe that they're trying to do power running. I just don't think that with the way that the rules are set up in this league, that that's necessarily going to be the way that any team is going to find success. So I'm not super excited about Cook. I do think that. Um, He'll probably end up being their goal line rusher, so he'll probably have at least some fantasy upside each week, but I wouldn't expect really anything from him in the passing game, so I think that severely limits his upside. Honestly, the running back that I'm personally more excited about and have ranked higher is Justin Stockton. Now, they didn't draft him until the eighth round, but he's only 24 and plays at a much higher speed than Cook. He averaged six yards per carry and averaged over 20 receptions each season in Texas Tech. So while Stockton may get vultured near the goal line, I think he's a better all-around rusher and should be a decent tier two guy with, an op with the upside to be a running back one in the XFL. So... Between those two guys, I would much rather have Justin Stockton. And if people continue to pump up Tim Cook, I think you can probably get a running back one a little bit later in the drafts if you just wait and pick up Justin Stockton. Now again, I'm talking about rankings here. I actually have uh, rankings provided for you guys. If you click the link in the description or go to fantasyaddictionnetwork.com, you can access my rankings for absolutely no charge. I'm updating those for you guys daily as trades, waivers, cuts happen 
happen leading up to the season. So if you're interested in playing fantasy football in the XFL, feel free to check that out. That'll help you guys uh, draft the most dominant team that you possibly can in this inaugural season, give you guys a leg up over your competition. Anyway, let's keep going. So there's another running back in this team to note as well, Darius Victor. He is very short, bulky, and slow, very much like Tim Cook, but even less athleticism. I think if Cook doesn't end up doing well in the end zone, though, they'll probably shift over to having Darius Victor be the uh, red zone guy instead of Justin Stockton. So again, this leads to why Justin Stockton's overall value is a little bit lower because if he's not getting the red zone carries, that's what's going to be, especially in a league like the XFL, it's going to be incredibly important that you have players that score touchdowns. However, I think that Justin Stockton offers enough athleticism that he'll still score enough from, you know, further out in the field rather than just the goal line carries. So I think he still carries enough value. I'm not really interested in the other names here. Unless Justin Stockton goes down, then I think Tim Cook at least becomes relevant enough just based on volume alone. All right, well, let's get into the receivers. There's a bit of a disparity here as well. It seems like there's not complete clarity as to what the uh, Guardians are wanting to do with their offense. So there's... Um, and disparity between uh, what wide receivers people think are going to be better in fantasy. So for me, I think that D'Angelo Yancey is going to be the best receiver on this team. They drafted him uh, with their first overall pick. They took him at the 103, so he was the third overall player drafted in the skill position draft. He's highly athletic and a great route runner, and he has terrific hands. So he's not a downfield stretcher, but I really think that actually makes perfect sense because with uh, McLoin not really ever showing that he likes to throw it deep down the field, he averaged less than 10 yards uh, per throw in college and even during the preseason in the NFL, he always stayed close to the line. He's very similar to like Landry Jones and what we talked about in our Dallas Renegades video. So a receiver like D'Angelo, Yancey actually makes way more sense in terms of fantasy production because he's going to be able to create that separation off the line and should be peppered with targets each week so he carries a really high floor from a PPR perspective. Um, I mean, I don't mean to compare this in the way of saying that I think D'Angelo Yancey is as uh, talented as these guys, but when I think of Yancey, I compare him to someone like Keenan Allen in the NFL in terms of the way that I think his fantasy production will be scored, giving you that high floor every single week. And, you know, if all goes according to plan and he exceeds expectations, I think that he could be compared more to someone like Michael Thomas in terms of just consistent every week quarterback just peppers him with targets because he's the only guy getting open in his range that's comfortable for the quarterback to throw to. So I like Yancey a lot more, uh, but there's a lot of other analysts that really like uh, Mikhail McKay. Now, Mikhail McKay is also talented in his own right. He's 6'4", and there's plenty to be excited about. However, I would say if, like, if Yancey is more keen on Allen, then McKay is probably going to be closer to like your Amari Cooper. He relies on the big play. He has tremendous red zone presence and will probably end up getting a lot of touchdowns, so that's undeniable. But I think the thing that scares me off of McKay and leads me more towards Yancey is because he's a big play receiver, you need a quarterback that's able to hit him in stride down the field. And I just don't think that McLoin is able to do that. He's always been a, a quarterback that stayed closer to the line of scrimmage. So with a player like Mikael McKay, you want to be able to have the ability to hit him deep. And I, I just don't think that that's going to happen right now. So while I like his talent, and I think that he's still definitely worth a higher pick, I would rather have Yancey on my team than Mikael McKay. And then, um, you know, there's another receiver on, on the team that is probably worth looking at for fantasy, uh, uh, Tanner Gentry. So New York actually drafted, you know, three receivers back to back in the uh, draft. So Tanner Gentry was their third overall pick in the third round. Um, so Gentry offers a really good deal of burst, but again, not really that top end speed you'd like to see in a typical slot receiver. He played with Josh Allen in Wyoming, so he was another deep ball target. I think he averaged like 16 or 18 uh, yards per reception. So another big play receiver. So there's going to be two guys in the X and the Z. You've got McKay and Gentry that are going to be stretching the field, but when you have a quarterback that can't hit him in stride, he's just going to end up defaulting to throwing to uh 
Yancey over and over again, which again is why I think Yancey is the best option here, but I'm willing to be wrong. I just think that Yancey is going to be the best value play here, especially because most people are going to draft McKay over Yancey, and I think Yancey finishes as the better overall receiver. That's not to say that I don't think McKay won't have good games that make him worth starting. I just think that Yancey will be more consistent. All right, and then looking at the tight end, so we have EJ Bips here is the only guy to really consider for fantasy. He's big, slow, and doesn't have any eye-popping measurables, but overall, I think he and uh, I think he and McKay will likely soak up a lot of red zone. And again, those extra point targets, we got to talk about that because of, because of the way that the rules are structured in the XFL with no kicking extra points, there's going to be a lot more points available every time a touchdown is scored. So big play guys like McKay and Bibbs definitely do have some more upside because they'll most likely be targeted in those one, two, and three point conversion plays. So I think that's the best thing to be excited about EJ Bibbs. He's not gonna be a high target volume guy. He's not gonna get you a lot of yards, but he'll probably get a good number of touchdowns and conversions for you that if you don't draft tight end early, try to grab EJ Bibbs near the mid to late rounds because he's going to get a lot of red zone opportunities. Anyway, again, if you guys are curious or are looking to play fantasy football, you can download my rankings for absolutely no charge. There's a link in the description, or you can go to fantasyaddictionnetwork.com to download the, those for free. Again, we're keeping those updated for you guys all the way up until the XFL season starts, making sure you have every piece of information that you need to dominate your drafts. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video, and we will see you in the next one.